Um, so I'm going to begin by recapping some stuff that Laszlo and Ferro said in, in greater detail, maybe others, um, as to what the Ingleton, as to what the entropy region is. So suppose we have n discrete random variables. And then for every non-empty subset of 1 through n, we can talk about the uh, joint entropy of the xi for i in alpha. So you just take the marginals and off you go. OK, so this contains uh, information about conditional entropies and mutual information and so on. And, uh, uh, and putting these all together, we get a vector in k dimensions where k is 2 to the n minus 1, because we're excluding the empty set. You could set h empty set equals 0, but that would be silly. And this is what is meant by an entropic vector. And uh, the entropy region is just the collection of all entropic vectors. So this is some region in k-dimensional real space. And it's a very important uh, region. So I'll call this, uh, it's called gamma n, sorry, n star is typically what it's called. And uh, it's a very important uh, region, uh, objects in, not just in, in engineering. So in engineering, it allows you to, uh, well, in theory, it allows you to compute network coding capacities. It's uh, in statistics. It's in polymatroids. It's in, in group theory as well. So as a pure mathematician, uh, you'd be interested in that as well. So it's a, it's a fundamental object that spans many different areas. So the, uh, the group theoretic approach is as follows. Suppose you have a finite group. Now I realize there probably aren't so many algebraists here. A finite group is a set with a, a, a composition, a way of composing elements that uh, satisfies certain hypotheses. Associativity, there's an identity, and uh, there are inverses. So for instance, all permutations of some finite set, Sn would be such a thing. And suppose we have uh, subgroups. So that means these are also groups under the same operation. They are subsets of G that form groups under that operation. And then for a non-empty subset of 1 through n, we can set g alpha to be the intersection of all the gi's over i in alpha. And we can set h alpha to be then log to base 2 of the number of elements of g divided by the number of elements of g alpha. And the amazing theorem by Chen and Young is that uh, h alpha is entropic. But not just that, but moreover, in a sense, they, they generate all entropic points in the sense that the smallest convex cone containing these is gamma n star maybe closed, closure. So in a sense, they fill out all the entropic points. So if you're interested in what information inequalities there are, what uh, inequalities, linear inequalities satisfied by these points, it, you could just study linear inequalities satisfied by these th points instead, depending on whether you're a statistician, engineer, or a, a group theorist. And I mean, I started out as a group theorist, and it's kind of surprising that group theorists are not aware of this subject, in fact. OK, so what are those inequalities? So there are the Shannon-type inequalities. 
So I'm still on review, recapping. So they come in various flavors. There's that H alpha is uh, greater than or equal to zero for all alpha, because we're talking about discrete and uh, random variables and entropies thereof. That H alpha minus H beta is greater than or equal to zero whenever alpha contains beta. So that's uh, non-negativity of conditional entropy, or else it corresponds to a, uh, an obvious statement involving the subgroups. And then there's the submodularity statement, which says that this inequality is greater than or equal to zero for all alpha and beta. So that's the, where the polymatroids come in, for instance. So this is submodularity. So they satisfy uh, these, and uh, so the set of all satisfying these is, uh, well, let's call that gamma n. So th that is the uh, set of points satisfying all these, and it is potentially larger than gamma n star, but, uh, and it's very nice, it's a polyhedron, clearly, because of the nice uh, linear expressions here. And uh, uh, so one might ask, how close is it? Um, let me just note that uh, gamma n and gamma n star closure are closed convex cones with the points at the origin. So we might hope for gamma n to equal gamma n star bar. And in fact, uh, gamma 2 star is gamma 2. Gamma 3 star isn't quite gamma 3, but its closure is. But then things start getting a little wacky, in fact, very wacky, uh, for n equals 4. So uh, let's focus on n equals 4. Let me just say, so uh, Zhang and Raymond Young found uh, the first non-Shannon inequality. Uh, and that is for n equals 4. And so there are some weird inequalities that when I mention this to group theorists, they get excited and for a little while and then they realize they can't actually do anything with it, this weird inequalities, but um, anyway, they're there. Um, and, uh, and then uh, Ferro uh, uh, found lots of, well, actually several people afterwards found lots of inequalities, but Ferro in particular found enough to uh, show that gamma n star is not even, uh, well, gamma n star bar is not even polyhedral. And I guess uh, you've been hearing about that last week. OK. Uh, for n greater than or equal to 4. OK. So um, as I said, let's focus on n equals 4. And um, we're interested in a certain expression due to the British mathematician Ingleton, which, so for n equals 4, there are 15, we're in 15 dimensional real space, and uh, D is this expression here, which seems a little like it's pulled out of nowhere, but it actually is very important. So it involves 10 of the 15 variables, although in fact there are, if you do permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4, there are six such expressions, but I'll just stick with this one of the, those expressions. The six, that, and so we have the Ingleton hyperplane given by d equals 0, and uh, so the way I've arranged it, the Ingleton uh, satisfying points are correspond to d less than zero, so those are Ingleton satisfying, and then the Ingleton violating points are d 
are on this side of the hi hyperplane. And so these are Ingleton violating points. And uh, you may notice the way I've drawn it like a muffin that uh, the uh, bottom part is polyhedral and any Ingleton satisfying that, that part of gamma n star coincides with gamma n. So the interesting stuff is what happens in the Ingleton violating region. From a, an, an engineering point of view, what's uh, interesting here is that linear network coding, scalar or vectorial, uh, schemes co uh, correspond to points over here in, in some sense. And so um, uh, asking how, how big this region is is sort of asking uh, how far from optimal uh, are you if you use a, a linear network coding scheme when maybe you should be using a nonlinear network coding scheme. That's sort of loosely speaking what it is. So in this case, like I say, gamma 4 star is in r to the 15, which I, I, uh, I can't draw on a two-dimensional board, but uh, you get the idea. OK. Um, any question? Pardon? So, um, so D, D, there are points that, uh, so gamma and star is on both sides of this. This is, uh, I mean, when I talk about Shannon or non-Shannon, I'm looking for outer bounds to the region. But this, this here cuts through the region. Well, yeah, yeah. So actually, I'll say that in a moment. So in fact, um, let me, that leads into, I think I can answer that right now. So you can ask, uh, as I was intimating, how far does, does the muffin top stretch out? And because it's a cone, you need to normalize it. So we normalize it by dividing by h1234. This I call the Ingleton score. By the way, some people have minus d in place of d, and so their numbers come out negative. But I've put it this way. And so um, the Shannon type inequalities say that s is less than or equal to a quarter. And when you throw in all the other inequalities we know, uh, then you get that s is less than or equal to 3 19 So that's the sort of uh, information that these inequalities tell you about uh, how far that sticks out. Is that what you were asking about? S is less than or equal to a quarter. So if you, if you work with, yeah. But then if you use these stronger inequalities, you can get it down to S less than or equal to a, a 3 19 And, and I'll, in a moment, I'll return to the question of how large can S actually get. Any other questions? OK, uh, let me just say that this is uh, work with a former student of mine now at Google, Ting Ting. None. OK. So um, I'm interested in producing points over here and asking how far does it stretch outwards. OK. So the smallest Ingleton violating case in terms of groups was uh, found by Mao, Thil, Hasibi. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, and uh, the, their group has is all permutations of five. So S, S n means permutations of n letters. So this is a group of size five factorial, 120. And uh, I don't want to go into a lot of group theory, but let me set fr q to be the set of affine linear transformations. Uh, uh, I should call it GFQ, <laughs> Galois field Q, um, maybe. Um, so uh, the, it's a certain group with size Q times Q minus 1 affine linear transformations of GFQ. So in this case here, G1 is, you can embed 
uh, for a two, uh, no, for a three, sorry, for a three. So this has q, q minus one elements because b is anything and a is non-zero. So g1 is for a three, which is s3 as well. Uh, and g2 is for a five. And g3 and g4 are dihedral uh, of order eight, which uh, the symmetries of the square, if you as a group, for instance. And in this case, they got d was just uh, slightly bigger than zero. But I mean, it is the first one, log to base 2 of 16 over 15. And the Ingleton score is 0 0.013. So quite a lot smaller than 3 19 <clears throat> They also found some examples with uh, a group, which I won't define, PGL2Q, 2P, say, where D is log to base 2 of 4 P minus 1 over 3 P. So bounded by log to base 2 of 4 thirds. And uh, as the size of the groups go up, then the, these go down to 0. So they're not threatening uh, the bound. The next smallest is, uh, I think, very interesting. is uh, g is the product, so you, you take a set product and uh, do the group action separately on both. a4 cross a4. So a4, one way of describing this is it's the for a 4, so it's order 12. Alternatively, there's always this subgroup of uh, half the size. So there's, uh, if you do group theory, you learn about this uh, subgroup with, uh, of even permutations. The interesting thing about this case, so let me just say, so G1, G2 are isomorphic to A4. G3, G4 are Z mod 3 cross Z mod 3. So integers mod 3 cross integers mod 3. Um, and, the and this gives uh, d is log to base 2 of 9 eighths, and s is 0 0.024. And you could keep going. I mean, you can keep generating. But I mean, so what? You want some interesting theory. One point I want to make here is that this is what's called a solvable group, uh, meaning it's made up out of abelian groups in some way, whereas S5 is not, and uh, most, and nor are these. So uh, P, P here is at least 5. OK. So is there some systematic way? How am I doing for time? I don't know what time it is. OK, good. Thank you. Um, so is there some systematic way of uh, producing these. And it turns out that, yes, indeed, there is. And you can just produce whole families of them. OK, so here's the uh, systematic method of producing examples. OK, so yeah, so if A and B are subgroups of G, then we set AB to be the set of all pairs A and B with A in A, B in B. Now, this may or may not be a subgroup. OK? There's no reason if you do this, you get a It would be in an abelian group or something simple like that. But in general, uh, not. So um, we call a group G factorizable 
if G can be written as A times B, uh, where A and B are non-trivial proper subgroups. Okay? So, and there's a big literature on factorizable uh, groups. I mean, there's a huge book by Roland Schmidt, for instance, has been a popular uh, topic of study for many years amongst group theorists. Okay, so the theorem then is that D is actually simplifies to a lot simpler expression. You see, if you wrote if you wrote this out in terms of order of g over order of g one two three, the log of that plus log of order of g, it, it, it gets pretty complicated. It's going to have ten terms, whereas uh, it actually simplifies that this holds if and only if g three factors as g1 intersection g3 times g2 intersection g3 and g4 factors as g1 intersection g4 times g2 intersection g4. So this theorem will be used to produce uh, uh, systematically uh, good examples. So. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, we wrote it out, but it doesn't sort of mean anything particularly. Yeah, I don't know. Well, so if the group is abelian, then you're always on, uh, on uh, this side. But there are lots of examples coming from non-abelian groups on this side. Yeah? I read this a long time ago, but doesn't this mean that the original information between 1 and 2 given 3 is 0? And isn't that true for the groups, the ones, the ones that you're constructing? That's, what, because you're, that's why you get the cancellation of the terms. Yeah, OK. That's probably, actually, that's probably the answer to yeah, yeah, that's probably that's actually probably true. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so thank you. So systematically, yeah. In fact, we should note that down. Um, okay, so systematically, uh, you you proceed as follows. Okay, so you let's you say A B is a factorizable uh, subgroup of S N with let's stick to proper factorizations. So those are where. Uh, a intersection B is, triv is as small as possible, so that means that the size of G is the size of A times the size of B. Um, okay, and then um, suppose you take some element of Sn, and then you set G1 to be the subgroup, the smallest group containing A and its conjugate, and the smallest subgroup containing G to be the, G2 to be the smallest subgroup and its conjugate uh, under G. And you set G3 to be this factorizable group, and G4 to be G inverse G3 and G. And the idea is, oh, and then G should be the subgroup, the group, which is a subgroup of Sn generated by everything. And then um, the idea is to choose 
little g such that g1, so you want g1 to be relatively small. See, in general, this could be the whole of Sn or something for a random g. But you want this to be a and this to be b. And then you're in good shape. And, uh, and this often produces large d. So let me give a couple of examples of that. I'm not assuming A and B, no, it's very important. A and B is not assumed normal. So you get interesting factorizations. Otherwise, uh, um, I mean, I, I think with A and B normal, you're not going to violate Ingleton. Well, actually, you, yeah, no, it could go either way. It could go either way. It could go either way, as you'll, as you'll see. But I mean, A and B in general are not going to be normal in, in uh, in Sn, but they could be A and B could be normal in A times B. Yeah, I mean it could go either way. But some of the more interesting cases are where A and B are not normal in A B. Okay, uh, so let me uh, the the two examples given uh, before. So we had the Mao Thil Hasibi example. So here we take S5. So we take inside S5. We take A, a certain subgroup of order 2, and B, a certain subgroup of order 4, and it and its conjugate generate the, that Frobenius group that I wrote down before. Uh, for a 3, these generate for a 5, and A times B is uh, this dihedral order 8. So that's, that's sort of really what's uh, going on there, and with the uh, G equals PGL two P examples they had, then A was still cyclic order two, and B now was cyclic order P minus one, and uh, and again those uh, those followed in that way. For the A four cross A four examples, okay, so A four cross A four actually sits inside S eight, and in this case. Uh, you get it if you take A, a certain uh, cyclic su uh, subgroup of order 3, and B, a certain cyclic subgroup of order 3, which I can give you the details. But uh, the interesting thing is, can we use this to generate more examples? And we can. So we can get some uh, seriously large Ds and Ss using uh, this example. Here's a better example, kind of a curious example, is, uh, so we start with a factorizable group. Let's take S3 cross S3. Okay, that factors as S3 times an S3. But in fact, it also factors where A is Z mod is cyclic of order 6, and B is cyclic of order 6. So it has this uh, sort of non-standard factorization. In fact, if you want to check, if you don't believe me, then take the uh, permutation generated by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and B is the permutation generated by 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4. OK? And then we take G, so we're going to now uh, stick this inside S7, so we can take G to be 1, 2, so this doesn't actually give you anything really interesting inside S6, but it gives you a very nice example inside S7, so you take G to be this permutation, and now D is as large as log 72 over 49, which is actually the largest that you get for S7. And the corresponding S is as high as 0 0.045. And so you can uh, carry on and produce examples. And uh, you find uh, that all, all the best examples are produced in this way. And uh, you can produce a lot more using this and taking interest. You take Mathieu groups and factorizations of interesting examples. Yes? S3 
S3, semi-direct product S3. Um, well, I don't, I'm not sure. There is a non-trivial semi-direct product of S3 by S3. I think there may only be S3 cross S3. I mean, I can't calculate groups of order 36 in my head, but uh, I, I, I think there may only be the direct product. But I mean, that's the sort of game you could play if there were. But, but I mean, what's interesting here is actually it's, uh, it's it, in, in, it tends to be the cyclic subgroups. So groups that factor into, they, they have a certain name that I forget off the top of my head, bicyclic groups, they're products of two cyclic groups. So those tend to give you some very good examples. Any questions? Um, okay, so, so you can keep playing this and, and you get S, S you get as high S uh, using this method, you get as high as uh, examples, I found examples as high as 0 0.089373, which uh, I will, which is kind of interesting because I, I don't get examples larger uh, using the group theoretic method, though I'll explain why there should be. So let's return to the big question which is uh, what is the largest soup of S? So as you vary over all choices of four discrete random variables, you find these points, how far out does it go? And you recall that uh, the given inequalities say it's at most 3 19ths, and there was the four atom conjecture due to Doherty, Freiling, and Zieger, which suggested that the sup of S should be 0 0.089373. Um, this, what the heck is this? Well, it's called the four atom conjecture because it comes from a, uh, the, uh, so the probability mass function on the four variables uh, has uh, the xi all binary. So a priori, uh, you have to give 16 values, two to the four values, uh, but uh, you actually make all of but four with all but four. So in other words, the size of the support of P is four. And uh, for a long time, that was the, the largest S that, that uh, was found. And then uh, Ferro and uh, Laszlo surprised everyone by showing you could get higher. Certainly surprised Tingting Ting and myself. Um, so uh, they So they disproved this just a couple of years ago. Amazing result. Um, and uh, their, their method was actually very interesting. They uh, cast it involving a question on uh, polymatroids and uh, um, decomposing them into, um, anyway, um, I don't really have time to go into it, but, um, but what they showed from our, uh, our point of view is that uh, given a point, so you take your four random variables, you get a point in, uh, in here, and you can actually find another point further out. And uh, so uh, they, so, so we have the old score, S of the four random variables, okay? And what they showed is that you can get, there's a new score, a new Ingleton score. So this is the score they, they uh, by uh, studying the associated polymatroids. And so you get this new Ingleton score, and uh, if, x1 through x4 are nary random variables, then uh, 
Ting Ting and I, and probably others, get a formula for S tilde, the new score. Okay, so basically uh, you, you get this, this uh, function. So this, this here is, so um, the numerate, so in, in the n to the four variables, so just like here you have 16 variables, if these are binary, you have n to the four variables, x, i, j, k, l for your PMF uh, with zero. And what you want to do is you want to maximize that expression as uh, the x, i, j, k, l vary over non-negative uh, real numbers with the sum to one, right? And this formula is very ugly, but uh, there it is. It's um, so just to give you an idea of what the shape of it is, is the numerator and denominator. So, well, let me let g of x be the function x log x. And then the numerator and denominator that go into uh, are uh, linear combinations of g of linear combinations of the x, i, j, k, l. OK? So you get this. Uh, so even in 16, even for n equals 2, it's quite an ugly expression. The, the difference between this and s is the numerator is the same, but the denominator gets uh, changed slightly, is actually what, what happens. So now what we want to do is we want to maximize s tilde. OK? So it's a maximization question. Unfortunately, this expression here is not convex, not concave. So it's a, it's a really kind of ugly expression. Um, but, uh, we're, uh, but it does have some other nice property. So this is the bad news. The good news is that uh, it has uh, lots of symmetry, as you might imagine, because you, you, you switch the four variables around and you do various other things. Um, so in fact, what's called the invariance group, so the group under which of symmetries of this function, so g of this permutation, I mean, this s tilde of this permutation applied to the point is s tilde of the original point. The, uh, is a group uh, called SN, tilde, SN wreath C2. It's a certain, it, it has size 4, n factorial to the 4 is its size. So for instance, for n equals 2, it has size 64. It has 64. Now, um, so we can try and maximize it. The apparent maximum, I mean, I, I wage a lot of money on this because uh, for only 16 variables you can be fairly, uh, uh, for, for n equals 2, you can be fairly sure, is 0.091036. And uh, in fact, there are, uh, yeah, so there's an interesting issue here. So when you maximize a symmetric function, the points where the maximum arises need not be symmetric themselves under everything. So it turns out that the maxima are symmetric under a subgroup <coughs> of size 4. So in fact, if you think of it, there's an orbit, so by orbit stabilizer, there's an orbit of 64 over 4, which is 16 such maxima. 
I mean, that's what's happening is, is the, 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 the uh, symmetry group, the invariance group, acts transitively on these maxima, and they're all isolated. You can check there are, they are isolated maxima. And uh, so that's the, the best you can do for n equals 2, apparently. OK. Yeah, sure. So, when you just try to fully understand what you just said, you actually did build a group attaining that score, although you could take the probability. No, no. In fact, in fact what is. What is no, we just, we just maximized or tried to, we, we saw how large can we get this, this function to be. Um, what, is, what is weird is that using the group theory, we can get up to this bound, but uh, so far we have been unable to find points beyond that, but we should be able to. I mean, there should be groups that, you know, produce that, but what do they look like? I mean, I know what the groups that uh, approach this bound look like, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little mysterious. So actually, when we first heard of your work, then we were rather doubtful that it was correct, because, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but, uh, you know. Well, and then we got a copy of it so we could study it, and it's correct. Um, but uh, I mean, it was just like, where, where did this come from? Because we'd never seen any points that, uh, you know. I mean, and still, it's still this indirect method it isn't really giving you, you know, the points directly. So it's a little strange. Okay, so uh, for n equals 3, um, in fact, uh, you, the, the maxima that you get, or the maxima that we've only ever got, are all the n equals 2 cases in disguise. So here you're maximi what I mean by that, here you're maximizing a function of 81 variables. And what I mean is that you, um, if you clump together in, in these 81 variables in kind of clumps of 16, then you get, uh, you get this maximum and, uh, at the same point. So th there's a theory that allows you to take one of these maxima and produce infinitely many for any larger n maximum. Do you have a question? Or? Yeah. Five, yeah. OK, well, that's good. I'm almost done. Um, OK, so for n equals 4, uh, we, uh, so now we're, we're in uh, 4 to the 4, 256 variables. And the apparent maximum is So, uh, uh, and uh, which is slightly larger than uh, than your example, but um, but only slightly, um, and uh, and um, well, as far as I know, this is the largest. So so we know that the sup of s is somewhere between this and three nineteenths, and. Uh, Again, we get, uh, so in this case, you get 4 times 4 factorial to the 4. And oh, now in this case, the stabilizer is uh, dihedral of size uh, 16. So symmetries of a regular octagon. So you get uh, this many, and you get this many isolated maxima. So you get one orbit of uh, maxima all giving you this value, what it's worth. Then you carry on for n equals 5, 6, etc. We just get our best examples are just this in disguise. OK? So for n equals 8, so there's a, a theory that I don't have time to go into why the n, which are powers of 2, is related to binary rooted trees, why those are, should be new cases. For n equals 8, there's this thing at Wisconsin called the Center for High Throughput Computing, which is a massive cluster. And uh, it's used, they used it for the Large Hadron Collider. The physicists at Wisconsin like to use it for the Large Hadron Collider. They use it for the Ice Cube project at the Antarctic. So Ting Ting and I are currently the fourth highest consumer of, of this, just looking to maximize this one uh, expression in 8 to the 4 
uh, what's that, 4096 uh, variables. And uh, we've been running this now for two years. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say that uh, we haven't been able to, to beat this. So this is the, uh, so you could make the 256 atom conjecture or uh, like I would believe that, you, that somewhere in there is a very rare example that beats it. But I mean, we're, we're trying to exploit, so if we can guess what the right stabilizer is, then you can impose that condition and shorten it down. But we can't guess, we haven't been able to guess what the pattern is from this group of order 4 to this group of order 16 and so on. So uh, yeah, so you know. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I had the same punchline in Prague like a year and a half ago, and uh, it's, uh, it still hasn't uh, revealed its secrets yet. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs>